So microservices are great, but one of the biggest pain points of adopting them is keeping data consistent across different databases. The challenge becomes even steeper when we are dealing with money. You just can't let a transaction go unnoticed. And hence, to talk about it, we have someone who has done it at scale, Arjun from Razorpay. For folks who don't know, Razorpay is India's biggest payment gateway that makes it super simple for businesses to accept payments and manage payouts. I'm definitely oversimplifying it over here. But more importantly, from the engineering front, they have faced or they face some of the most interesting challenges and have built some of the most amazing solutions to cater to them. They are widely known for having a strong engineering culture and a great engineering block. To be really honest, it is one of the best out there. So before we start, I'd like to thank the entire Razor Pay team for being such a sport and for joining me in discussing how they achieve data consistency across their microservices. So let's jump right into it and we'll start with knowing Arjun. Arjun, the stage is all yours. Thanks, Arpit. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. I'm Arjun Tomar and I work in the payments platform team of Razorpay. Uh, I have been with Razorpay for more than three years now. Uh, I think I have been really fortunate enough to be part of Razorpay. And, uh, uh, and I think the timing for me was pretty right when I joined Razorpay, right? It was a time where 2018, we started seeing a lot of growth PPI volume and uh, the lot of traffic coming on the online transactions from different e-commerce companies, from the gaming companies. And that's the part which I like the most about it. And I able to uh, be the part of the system and uh, see the growth of Razorpay. So that journey, I have seen it, right? So that journey, which makes me also a good in the professional design. And the another another important part I want to highlight about Razorpay is the culture. So uh, mm -hmm. if I want to talk about, right, uh, if you go see our Slack channels, it's full of memes. So we have kind of a meme culture. We do any kind of announcement, it starts with a meme. And oh. the kind of ownership that Razorpay provides for each and every developer or engineer, right, that's, mm -hmm. that's amazing. So uh, I think I've been very lucky to be part of Razorpay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, like it, it's it's always fun to be part of a startup that is just thriving, and you see that phase where where it is about to see that hockey stick growth, and like like really yeah. happy, really happy to be having this conversation with you, who has been there, done that. What was I? Let's let's do a deep dive on it. Okay, but obviously, uh, we know uh, Razorpay is a big name now. You handle a large amount of payments, and obviously, won't reveal any numbers, but huge amount of payments. And obviously, I am also a happy customer of yours, so uh, be, be assured of that. <laughs> And, but everything has a very simple beginning, right? What was a day zero architecture of Razorpay look like? Cool. So I, I think when Razorpay started serving the mm -hmm. traffic, right, for, for the payments, uh, it was just a payment gateway. And uh, it was the initial stage where we wanted to ship features fast. We wanted mm -hmm. to be part of those revolution in fintech firm and want to be part of differently, right? So we wanted to build mm -hmm. traffic. We want to serve the traffic. We want to uh, be the part of the fintech uh, of the revolution that's happening so at that time we wanted to build a lean stack and that lean stack uh, that's where we started looking out into different languages and which is easy for mm -hmm. the developers to start learning through it right and just just go and start coding and start releasing the features so that's where uh, we started using php with laravel and uh, it mm -hmm. was a pretty lean stack and we were using aws for our deployments and we were using the route 53 micro uh, aws service for uh, hosting the domain over there and getting traffic and uh, then there was an ALB and then the other hop was directed to our monolith service. So it was a monolith architecture that for day zero architecture mm. and we were using mm. MySQL RDS instance for our persistence layer. So MySQL, RDS, PHP, Laravel and basic AWS tech. Pretty, pretty, like pretty yeah. hyper optimized for quick feature delivery. Pretty interesting. And, 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 and uh, to be honest, most companies and uh, most companies start with with a very similar architecture because they don't know if they are even going to survive or not so let's just keep it simple let's ship features we'll solve things later like like that's that's a kind of go-get attitude that we need when 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 we are working at startup brilliant yeah. so with this you you spoke about having uh, a monolithic database and that is where uh but still when we are building something for the payments ecosystem it is highly important to ensure consistency of data because is it's payment you just can't have amount deducted from a but not getting credited to b you can't just miss on transactions so how did you achieve uh like like what were the key factors that you thought about when you wanted to achieve high data consistency or rather if i may put it strong consistency of data 
when you were in that state when your database was monolithic where everything was there in one deep correct uh, so uh, I, i think you got it correct right so if if you're working in the payment system you have to make sure your data is consistent enough right mm-hmm. because you don't you you want the trust of the customers because your initial days you have you want to have a trust of the customers yeah. you also want to serve the traffic you also be the part of the revolutionaries of the fintech firm right so that's mm-hmm. where we also chosen the mysql so we we want the asset mm-hmm. compliant database and that's where we started mm-hmm. choosing mysql as a database right because that provides high consistency right and mm-hmm. since it was a mysql uh, rds uh, in the initial days of our architecture uh mm-hmm. we we were having this foreign key constraints and the unique constraints all over the database mm-hmm. tables uh which was providing the correctness right mm-hmm. uh that was our first main so to provide correctness we wanted to have this kind of constraints on a database itself but mm-hmm. when we start uh developing more and more features we actually mm-hmm. uh, analyzed these foreign key constraints were actually pulling us back okay mm-hmm. and uh, the reason behind that ki uh, how your foreign key constraint works right so basically uh, when you do a update query or you do a, a delete query or any any kind of query over there uh, it takes a lot of load on database you're doing an insert it takes a lot of load on database and it actually gives a write stalls and uh, increase the latencies and whatever the background process is happening on mysql database mm-hmm. also takes a hit so that's where we moved our all the constraints to our application logic and we built such custom orm where mm-hmm. all the constraints has been put over there since it is a monolithic da- database and we were using laravel as a an, as a language of php mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. it provides such custom orm so we can write a rich validation layer to uh, for any query that we are building so that oh. was the first initial thought and we were using for the consistency over there pretty interesting you you covered some really interesting part first part where you spoke about uh you had a bunch of constraints you spoke about foreign key constraint but you also added the part that foreign key constraint slows things down and this is something yes. that most most engineers or other most companies if 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 i may want to exaggerate on that part they don't really think we we keep on adding foreign key checks <laughs> everywhere possible like that's how we are taught to design good database schema but that's really yeah. interesting that when we operate at scale and and as you very rightly said that when you started seeing that high amount of traction foreign key constraint was pulling you all down and this is so counterintuitive to the approaches that we typically observe we just like hey, we need strong consistency but now that you spoke about it you remove foreign key checks but then you still need to ensure consistency because foreign key checks is database's way to provide us strong correct, consistency correct. but now you removed yeah. it then you talk about that you added it to application code so which means yes. that uh all of your foreign so you dropped all the foreign key constraints is it so yeah. no foreign we key dropped constraints from all database. the each emitter mm-hmm. no constraints at a database yeah so and then uh, and we built it on to our application brilliant application which means everything would be running on a transaction in your application side and there all these checks are checked correct correct yes oh. yes yes so you can imagine right uh, let's take about example mm. uh, how the foreign key works basically uh, if if your parent is depend mm. like payment entity is dependent on order entity uh, mm. the payment order should be present in your table until unless you cannot insert the payment entity right that's how foreign mm. key works mm. now those checks those validation we have provided into our application in our custom mm. orm so that's how we have done it so uh, we have written our own repository managers own repo functions and and built all those validation layer into application wow so much of cool engineering stuff happening behind the scenes god you would have to build so much of stuff to ensure that but yeah you have to do it like like there is no way yeah, out there is yeah. no way out <laughs> brilliant so i have i've also heard about a very interesting uh, 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 a a very interesting constraint called check constraint uh, have you have you by any chance used it uh, somewhere uh no i don't think so we have used a check not constraint in, not okay really. and then uh but okay now because uh, a check constraint is typically used where where i've seen a bunch of architectures or rather a bunch of database designs where people want to ensure some sort of custom constraints on the values that you insert on the table it's not foreign key but it's mm-hmm. values that you insert on basically what kind of values are you allowing to be inserted so for example correct, let's say correct. a column for some reason cannot have value between minus 5 to plus 5 hypothetical example but if you want to add that you can use check constraint so i've seen a bunch cool. of uh designs where they have used it so i thought maybe 
they are payments they uh, used it maybe you folks also used it so just 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 basically taking a shot in the dark that's right so all uh, those things right all, all those things were put a part of the validation layer so let, let's say you're building an entity in your laravel and those yeah. entity has those validators right and those validators yeah. validators will take care of all the check constraint unique constraint default constraints yeah. everyone's part of the all your validations so you can actually define that this column length has to be from 125 to 126 so uh, those all things are part of your application logic right now in resopay so all of the so so you have check constraints like you have basically mimic check constraints but everything on the application side god correct, the application correct, correct, code correct. must be so huge <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I bet, I bet. <laughs> no, but no, but that that has to be there to ensure strong consistency. There is no way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but yeah, we always see like we all start with monolith, but obviously there comes one day, one day where you see that are monolith. This is what I don't want anymore because our company cannot scale with monolith. What was that day like? What was the day when you um, decided? Are now I have to go to microservices. What? How? How was it all about? Are, um i i i believe that's going to be where i joined resupe in 2019 right uh, yeah. that was the year basically uh, when we started getting a lot of traffic from this events called ipl so mm. for for people who's enjoying the manage match is basically the mm. four hour four hour of match of ipl but what happens in just before the match of 30 minutes it was resupe has to look at all the graphs and do the stuff over there right uh, yeah. that's where in 2019 we started getting traffic from food gaming like zomato Uh, Swiggy just before the match and and Dream Eleven, My Eleven Circle, we all got the traffic from there. So what we seen at that time, uh, mm-hmm. because we're getting a burst of traffic from multiple merchants, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, now what was happening since uh, this our My SQL has a limit of database connections, right? Now mm-hmm. our PHP application was running on top of your Apache web server. So how Apache mm-hmm. web server works is basically until unless your request is terminated, it does not release the resources. okay and your php does not have connection pooling right mm-hmm. so now what is happening uh, when the burst of traffic is coming to raise up uh, it was not raising the connection and you know the bank ecosystem right they they sometimes take a lot of time and in 2019 yeah. it was they were also building some like, to serve the traffic they they were also evolving mm. so uh, what happened that time uh, our database connection limit start hitting okay we we mm-hmm. are seeing a lot of idle connections and and uh, that's where uh, we started seeing the failure so in 2019 we actually have to throttle the merchants we did, we did not want it but we had to throttle to save our system right mm-hmm. uh, just because mm-hmm. just because we were we did not have the connection php does not support connection pooling right yeah. uh, and uh, it, it was a wake up call for us i think that's that's the wake up call for us to start looking into the microservice architecture because uh, we were becoming we were doing the tremendous growth year on year and we were mm-hmm. seeing the 2x growth each and every each and every year right and uh, we started getting a lot of traffic so uh, that's where we actually decided uh, let's now think about a microservice architecture uh, and like moving away from moe to microservice is not the easy job it's a multi quarter multi year job right uh, you cannot just move in a one day it's just not a overnight job right yeah. so we yeah. we started parallelly working on our monolith because we want to mm-hmm. serve the traffic and we also mm-hmm. started working on the microservice architecture God, that's such an interesting time. But but one thing that that is uh, really fascinating to know that mm-hmm. IPL, like who would have thought, like when when people hear the word IPL or they hear the word cricket streaming, they think of hot star. They 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 basically think of live streaming. But who would have Correct. thought that when when IPL is about to start, payment system take like like are also under pressure. And that's such an interesting insight because. it's not that users are directly interacting with razor pay users are users are basically purchasing food items ordering groceries on other platform they are building things on let's say my circle 11 or basically dream 11 or somewhere they are using your system and you are getting affected by the second order effect like god the world is connected <laughs> yeah <laughs> no when you folks are under pressure but yeah but as a but as a finance business you have to be up 24/7 because Correct. If razor pay is down, it's a revenue loss for them, and that cannot yeah. happen. So your uptime, your availability is far more important than any other system's availability. Brilliant. It, like, it has I'm, to be. It has I'm to be. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. <laughs> so then your wake up call was that uh, connection pooling not there. So you have to like you have to evolve. You have to split it into microservices and all. And while and you 
you raised a very very solid reason that like a, a very solid concern that you cannot just stop the whole world and say hey we are moving to microservices we won't do anything else you still have to support your monolith your database to handle that kind of load while also evolving into microservices god that would have been fascinating Correct. but yeah best experience for so so far because that's yeah. the journey that every engineer dreams of taking great so uh one key thing that comes with uh splitting monolith to microservices apart from all the business logic split that is a different problem altogether but more importantly splitting of databases so splitting of monolith into microservices involves splitting of databases splitting of application code uh, splitting of core entities of your system so uh how 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 was that like like how was your thought process throughout when when you folks were splitting from mono to micro and how did you decide how to split because that's the biggest problem because you just can't say hey like that's an easy part when you say ki i have one service for notification one service for payments but here you are the entire payment stream so how yeah. how did you split your system into microservices like what was the thought process behind it correct uh, so i just mentioned right it's not a one at job so uh, mm. in razor pay we have the five more core entities if i mm. talk about the first one is a payment which stores the payments data and mm. then is the order which mm. stores the so order is actually highly related with the payments table and then mm. we have the merchants entity and mm. uh, then basically we have the ledger data which comes into a transaction in the balance table right so these are the biggest chunk of our monolith right so mm. what we decided uh, uh, we cannot we cannot stop the st- stop serving the traffic right so basically mm. we decided to make a choice ki uh, let's move the orders into order service ledger mm. the two tables of transaction and balance into a ledger service and all mm. the payment methods like if we talk about card upi net banking into the different microservices right mm. that that was the main thought and uh, how so now basically we have to make sure ki we are still serving the traffic uh we are not we are data consistent while moving into microservices and uh, mm-hmm. we are also uh, uptime uh, highly available that time also right so how do we ramp up the traffic right mm-hmm. so uh, basically we, we we started so there were phases so the phase one was the dual write phase of the data once we are we have the microservice ready we do the dual write then we start ramping up the traffic so, so when you say dual write we sorry have to interrupt uh, sorry to interrupt but uh, when you say dual write it means writing to monolith as well as microservices like like both the correct database. correct uh-huh. correct 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 mm. so basically your main golden source of truth is still your monolith but mm. you're still writing data to your microservice right mm. so basically we are ensuring ki whatever data we are writing into our monolith is the same we are writing in the microservice okay once we have mm. the confidence we can start ramping up traffic even the ramping of the traffic takes a lot of challenges right uh mm-hmm. you cannot just ramp traffic from 0 to 1 so uh, we build a system which actually takes care of that which you call splits and uh, mm-hmm. that takes care of ramping up the traffic so basically you create experiments and mm-hmm. that experiments will take care how much traffic to route but so, even to uh, support that sort of random traffic that are moving over here you have to ensure that data is in that microservice db as well correct correct yeah, yeah. And, but so, then uh, uh, uh was this data been written across or uh, your monolith database and the corresponding microservice database in a transaction or was it being done asynchronously yeah so if i talk about dual right we we mm. uh, we decided what to how to man- manage the uh, the transactions right because you're writing the database your data here and you have to write it over and you have to make consistency over there also because you cannot mm. lose the data while writing the dual into microservice so yes. we started using the outboxer pattern and uh, what we did so basically uh, what is outboxer pattern right so uh, that is uh, just for the distributed transaction so basically mm-hmm. uh, your monolith you create another table uh, which is going to write so read your own writes which you call it right so uh, mm-hmm. you write to your main table source table and then you write mm-hmm. to outbox table and that outbox table data will flow to any async mechanism you can use and that mm-hmm. outbox data will flow through the uh, async mechanism to your microservice now if mm. let's say anything happens on your transaction right that outbox will also roll back right and uh, oh, once it. it does not mm. roll back it will actually push into your let's say we were using kafka over there and the workers are provided on the microservice side they were consuming the message from there and writing into their microservice database so that's how we maintain the consistency in the dual write phase brilliant so uh, using transaction outbox pattern uh, 
in order to solve dual rights, you because you cannot have distributed transaction because it would make Correct. your systems lose its throughput. So you wrote at two different tables within the same database, one where the actual right has to go, while the second one yeah. into another ad hoc table from that. And because it's your single database, your transaction within the database can take place. So if your right fails due to any reason, this would also roll back automatically because they're part of the same DB. And from Correct. this Correct. table, you are pulling the data out uh, using some consumers which are putting it in Kafka and from Kafka, some other consumers are pulling it and putting it into that microservices DB, right? Yeah, 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 correct. Right. Great. Nice. Pretty interesting. So you yeah, actually use transaction artworks pattern, which people theoretically read here and there from the internet. You see it in action. Brilliant. Yeah. So then you split across so many databases that happened. Uh, you solve the problem of dual right. That was your phase one. And then with your split yeah. service that is uh, wrapping up traffic on your microservices, you would, as soon as you get enough confidence, you would be increasing the percentage of traffic that should go to a microservice versus monolith. And then once 100% is Correct. there, you basically cut the cord and your monolith yeah. is then uh, phased out for that microservice. Like I'm just talking Correct. about Correct. one, but you would have tens and fifteens of microservices split out. So all of them are done. Then you leave out your monolith altogether. Got yeah. So just just one blunt number. If it's it's okay if you don't want to reveal, but uh, a rough number of databases that you handle in production. 10, 15, 20? Uh, I think it's more than that right now because God. right now we have a lot of microservice right now. Right? So, uh, so many data every data. microservice do their yeah. research and they they, 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 pro, they do the research and they provide like which kind of database they want to use. So we have right now MySQL, we have Postgres, we have Cassandra uh, for Redis, mm -hmm. we have Redis also for the caching purpose and for queuing mechanism also. We actually built our own service which we call as Metro. Uh, so the kind of architecture we are moving into microservice to maintain the transactions. So we are building all those uh, infra also to maintain the consistency across the microservices, That's which we have. For an engineer, you you have list you have just put out a buffet of databases. You said MySQL, yeah. Postgres, Cassandra, Redis, and you and you and you talked about queues. You talked about Metro. You have everything. <laughs> nice That's That's a buffet card. And, but then with so many databases, you're like, and obviously you, you are part of the, you are part of the payments platform team. So there would be so much of load on the platform team to ensure that developers are also productive. Like they make the right decision choices. There's a lot of at stake on your plate. Really yeah. good. Uh, but just one, one question on that part. Uh, if you can just like, just out of like slightly out of context, uh, how would you as a tech lead, help some other mm -hmm. developer in your team decide between SQL versus NoSQL. Just a random question I'm shooting at you. Okay, so that depends on the use case, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let's say uh, there are multiple services right now, mm -hmm. right? And you're working on the payment service. You have to decide what kind of data you're storing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how, what are the choices you want to make to choose MySQL and NoSQL database? Okay, what are the properties you want to store? Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to do certain kind of performance uh, checks also to, to make sure that whatever the database we are choosing, it's mm -hmm. going to serve the best traffic or not. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we are moving from Moet microservice, we did all those research. We did research on MongoDB. We did research on MySQL. We did research on Postgres. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually found out ki what are the challenges we are facing on MongoDB. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the kind of data we want to store, uh, even away, moving away from Monolith, mm -hmm. we want it to be asset compliant. Right. And uh, we wanted to be uh, strong rights happening on the database. And again, we actually came to the conclusion that yes, for payments, we actually have to use uh, the the actual relation database, right? Purely and because of asset where, compliance. Purely asset. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's where we decided to go ahead with the uh, relation database in most of the payment services, like your call about the card payment service, your mm -hmm. uh, net banking meter, so your order service. But mm -hmm. there are other services uh, which actually are using NoSQL also, right? Mm -hmm. Because their use case depends on that. So if I talk about mm -hmm. one of the services called Smart Routing, which actually mm -hmm. decide which gateway, which bank, which is who's serving the high success rate, has to uh, route the payments to, right? Now mm -hmm. that service actually have to analyze data. They are actually gathering mm -hmm. the data from the banks, key which bank is uh, doing great at that moment of time, so that we can route traffic to that particular bank. Right, so they are using MongoDB over there because uh, okay. th that's mm. the use case they they want to support. 
So it depends on the use case which microservice want to use which resources. So it's not really straightforward when we do payment. There is so much things going behind the scenes. Where to? Which bank to route request to? God, now correct, this is yeah. mind-boggling. Okay, let's let's talk about the elephant in the room. You have large number of databases, but being a payment system, you have to ensure consistency. But you cannot employ strong consistency because distributed transactions would lower down your throughput. That same problem that you started with monolith that hey we were we have to support large amount of traffic that circles back right again it stares at our face thinking hey if you do distributed transaction your throughput would be even lower so you cannot yeah. have you cannot do distributed transaction but you still have to ensure consistency of your data so how do you do it correct so um, uh, for consistency right so uh, mm. one of the most consistent that we want in recipe system is the merchant's balance right uh, mm-hmm. that has to be exactly corrected at every each and every point of time because mm-hmm. we do not want to lose the trust of merchants because they have integrated with us with the uh, highly published data and that ledger data cannot go wrong right and since we were in monolith everything was happening in the transaction block anything happens mm-hmm. it goes roll back to the back to the older state now moving away from monolith to microservices we have to ensure that consistency between the payment system and the ledger mm-hmm. system because now ledger moves mm-hmm. to a different microservice how do we record the balance uh, how, how do we actually make transactions over there right mm-hmm. so uh, and while mo- moving away from monolith we actually analyze which component is the part of thing that we actually can do a sync right mm-hmm. that can also achieve the low latency of payment apis right if we mm-hmm. if we doing some operation because everything was happening in synchronous in monolith now we also want to evolve and we provide low latency calls to our customers right for payments mm-hmm. so uh, yeah. where we actually thought ki ledger cannot can be a synchronous fashion because the settlements happen after t plus 1 and we are just recording the virtual account balance of a merchant right so uh, that's where we started looking into how to make system correctness and 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 we we looking into the eventual consistency of the system so mm. what was happening in monolith is the consistency mm. right now yeah. while moving away from monolith to microservice we actually uh, provided correctness of the data using eventual consistency of ledger data okay so you are ensuring the correct because that's really important for a payment system so you have to ensure the overall correctness of the data but you cannot have strong consistency because it would lower your throughput that's where yeah. you adopted you went for eventual consistency but eventual yes, consistency yeah. comes with a cost of delay so Correct. then you have to and now you have to ensure that the delay is bare minimum those are different kind of challenges that would come there but with eventual consistency what uh like how how like uh, basically first of all how did you implement eventual consistency like like what's the like what does a payment flow look like now with with you having cool. so many services yeah so if i talk about the payment flow now in the microservice mm-hmm. architecture it's let's say you're receiving the payment from the customer it's coming through your uh, uh, now we have our own infra layer with the authentication authorization happen which we call as edge and the request comes over there uh, and that it reaches to uh, your first microservice which is which is basically a method agnostic microservice and mm-hmm. it also creates the order so basically the request comes over there we actually from the payment request we decide which method is this payment request is and then it routes to the particular microservice which is either a card payment service or nv plus or your upi microservice mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. now you have done the payment processing your payment life cycle is over right now what to do like we have to record the ledger data of payment like whatever the payment has happened we have to credit that amount of payment to the merchant balance which is a account virtual account we are maintaining so mm-hmm. we started look using cdc pipelines for that so what is cdc pipeline so basically it's a data capture happening over your database right whatever the tables you are mm-hmm. writing it to those actually capture all the transaction logs and flow is through so uh, to different pipelines right so uh, now each and every payment system have mm-hmm. a, another table which is writing into a transaction block to which we call a outbox table mm-hmm. uh, again the same pattern same now, pattern. Mm-hmm. the ledge yeah the same pattern now this data of outbox is flowing via different cdc pipeline in each of the microservices and mm-hmm. posting into a kafka topic right now whatever the ledger service we have built they have consumers over there which is consuming from this kafka topic and posting mm-hmm. into a ledger data 
so what what is cdc is doing here right uh, mm-hmm. they are providing the bare minimum latency because they process uh, lakhs of messages within a second right uh, millions of messages in a second right and we were able to achieve with low low uh, what do you say uh, low latency between the payment system and we were able to record by eventual consistency right and mm-hmm. we actually using two way handshake mechanism between the payment system and the ledger system we we just not rely on the cdc so basically once the data has flown from cdc to the ledger system now mm-hmm. ledger will also do the cdc mechanism to uh, provide the acknowledgement to the payment service once we receive have the acknowledgement mm-hmm. then only we say yes the your ledger of this payment has been recorded brilliant so what's this what's this other flow doing so let's say now i made a payment it went through yeah. net banking it went to the yeah. net banking service it basically recorded the payment then a cdc pipeline kicks in which means yeah. that uh, whenever i commit my transaction you must be using something like a dbzm or or an airbyte something around that it reads Correct. the data puts it into a kafka topic a bunch of consumers read it of your ledger service and it updates the ledger from the ledger service what's this other flow what 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 yeah. exactly are you trying to solve there so yeah so let's say now how to make sure your payment and ledger has been in sync right we have mm-hmm. we have posted the transaction we have posted transaction data into your cdc pipeline and we mm-hmm. cannot just rely on uh, anything happen on the network right anything failure can happen so how do we make sure ki you have ledger has been recorded right so oh. so the whatever the so data it means, capture, it means that that definitely what the payment has done has ledger reflected the payment or not that correct, thing correct. you have to verify ah okay ha huh. uh, so now ledger do the same mechanism via cdc to provide mm-hmm. the acknowledgement to the payment system again so now payment system also have the consumer which is reading from the kafka topic so whatever the the unique id they have created we record it against the payment right so which so means that's in the how payment- Table of let's say net banking, you must be having a, a column like I'm. I might be oversimplifying yeah. it, but you must be having a way that this payment is it recorded in ledger or not, true or false? Correct. Something. Correct. Like correct. So correct. One this way and other that way. Insane. So it means that if let's say for some some duration of time, if a payment is not reflected in ledger, you can run a job that picks that amount and ensures that it gets reflected in ledger. So you are. ensuring that no entry is missed no matter what correct you you're not explicitly correct right because uh, that's a third point so make the system mm-hmm. more robust right we have a sla based mm-hmm. cron job also okay which actually which exactly does the same thing it actually fetches all the record in the payment source where the where the transaction id has not been recorded with the acknowledgement has not been recorded and then it goes back to the call ledger service again but what is it is doing right now it's calling the ledger service in synchronously so if any bad day your cdc goes down your worker goes down it's it going to call that. the synchronous uh-huh. way yeah if there any consumer lag uh-huh. is over there and you want to process the settlement mm-hmm. for a merchant then you can call it sync and do it if you would want to if you want to explicitly uh, settle uh, the the oral payments of a merchant you can like do it right away and this is not just correct. a correction but but also a feature ki if you would want yeah. to settle all the payments of a particular merchant you can right away do it god this yeah. is really interesting like like i did not think about that other route that you have to ensure because uh, correctness plays such an important part of a third you have to have to ensure that the entry is definitely recorded over there so like that's that's such an interesting thing because most people just would just push it to kafka and assume hey it would get picked up <laughs> how how are you sure that entry got reflected there pretty pretty interesting pretty interesting but yeah it it then obviously comes with its own challenge that like uh, 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 by the way what's the kind of lag that you play with because let's say the payment is accepted in the uh, in your let's say your basically net banking service how long mm-hmm. does it take on an average just a simple wild guess on that uh, so what's the time on an average the the, the replication lag between that uh if you're assuming your payment status has been updated at t uh, yeah. the maximum it can take uh, till now what we have seen because still we are in transition phase right uh, mm-hmm. it's it's just not all the merchants are not moved to your new ledger service 
right? Mm. It's still recording into the old ledger service. So again, we have two systems running into parallel time right now. Mm. Uh, so let's say if you're start, you're st- recording your payment status update at T. Uh, maximum we have, we have performance testing. What we have done, we have seen T plus two or T plus three seconds. That's it. So it's just taking another like two or three seconds to record in ledger, and to get an acknowledgement, another one second. So that, within that five seconds, very nice. Five seconds. Yes. So, and, and obviously, like let's say, if I, let's say I am your customer, so when I get an SMS about it, so by the time I go and uh, visit your platform, the number would have already been reflected. Like because, correct, correct, yeah, yeah. Because it would at least take me five seconds to log in to like like to open my laptop <laughs> and log in and and even click or open the app. So by the time a normal user. Uh, after seeing that notification coming on the platform, that payment is by default updated. Like very rare chance that it would take more than that. But then, in order to maintain a very strong SLA on that, you would be obviously provisioning your uh, consumers and your Kafka partitions according to that. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. So uh, if I talk about the settlements, right? Mm-hmm. How do we are handling? So there are certain merchants. Who who actually want settlements to happen at T plus zero? So when we call it T plus zero, because most of the domestic merchants do it settlements at T plus one or T plus two, they want the data into their actual bank accounts. Uh, mm-hmm. What are transaction happen for that merchant on after a one day or two day? Because mm-hmm. but there are certain mutual fund uh, merchants mm-hmm. uh, which wants the settlements to happen at T plus zero. So how do we handle that? Uh, so basically, we're talking about different Kafka topics, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, this outbox table contains also the priority of the message. Okay. Now your CD department take care of pushing those P zero messages into a different topic so that uh, you have multiple partitions over there. You can have multiple consumers so that they can actually do it much more faster than even that five, five seconds delay. Do it in a one second or two seconds. Nice. A classic case. A classic case where the customer is king. You have to do whatever it takes to please your customer. Like they need it, you have to build it, no matter yeah, what. Yeah. yeah. Such and such and like and uh, this is where uh, how I see this is as the beauty of having decoupled systems, like how yeah. you have decoupled your different services such that you have ensured replayability. And obviously, if I'm not wrong, everything would be idempotent. Like even if you receive everything. same event twice, it would not make uh, much of a difference because n number of times also if you receive the same message, it would not put your system in an incorrect state. So correct, idempotency, correct. ensuring that ensuring correctness. That's a beautiful yeah. piece of system you're working so the, i think to make sure <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like like we have just taken it live right we have done a lot of chaos testing uh, we have done a lot of fma scenarios to figure out what all what can go wrong on the worst day of razor pay right so uh, mm-hmm. we have taken down our kafka consumers we have taken down the pipelines we have taken down cron jobs we have taken down the whole ledger service at all and we have tested each and every scenario to figure out what all can go wrong right and, and that's where let's say if your debasium connector is going down so how it works it basically uh, they have commit offsets right so it only acknowledges mm-hmm. the commit offsets so now let's say if your debasium connector goes down when it restarts your debasium connector it picks from the last committed offset okay so that's where mm-hmm. our identity kicks in so if they are consuming the duplicate message again it does not record it again that's how the ledger has been built nice so you 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 spoke about some really interesting things. You spoke about rectification. You spoke about having a plan B because what if everything goes down? So do you also do some sort of like you do you use something like a chaos monkey or you explicitly take your infra down to see how it reacts? Like like how does that uh, thing look? So we do the, our own kind of testing. We have our search mm-hmm. regression suits and uh, we we write those test cases and we take our infra down manually right now. We don't have the mm-hmm. monkey testing. So we take the infra down while doing the testing and then and and then see how it reacts to that particular situation. So that kind of testing we have and we have built certain regression suits which kicks in to check the end to end flow of the payment, like how it started and if the data correction is there uh, after the payment has been done, the whole the payment flow, right? Uh, we have unit test cases. And now we have started writing when we are moving from more to microservices, microservice, again, another framework that we have introduced, which is slit, which we call is a service level integration testing. So what it does, uh, interesting names are huh? that splits. Now yeah. this is slit. Like you folks are great at naming <laughs> things. Okay. Slits. Hmm. So, so basically what it does, it, it checks the data between the upstream microservice and the downstream microservice. It does not test the whole flow. It just checks the contract between these services. Which are correct or not? Mm. So even if one service changes the contract, it does not affect it other service. So that's how we have written multiple types of framework for testing. 
do you like writing tests <laughs> uh obviously we have to we have to <laughs> even if you don't uh, want to we yeah. have to write it yeah you have to you you all must be having at least at least 95% coverage at least and, and i mean when it is at least 95% coverage <laughs> when you when you added so much of regression test and all and obviously building a payment system is no joke you have to ensure you have to have to ensure correctness completeness of your system and what not god chaos testing like whatever people just hear uh like or they read about these things on the internet you folks are actually doing it you folks are doing chaos monkey like it's like like some mini version of it at least you have regressions you have test suits like just just a random question on that part uh do you run all of these suits all of the tests on every deployment or some part of it it runs on every master commit of the repo and then mm-hmm. it again runs on the deployment of the application so, so post let's say right the sanity and uh, before yeah. deployment on the master commit correct 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 yeah god pretty interesting okay uh one question that would make me look very pessimistic has anything ever gone wrong that you had to fix it uh like something that should not have gone wrong but it did but then you had jobs or scripts to fix it right away like any any such example yeah. that you have oh i think that was one of the horrible incident i had to dig deep and figure out uh, mm-hmm. it was again including ledger so uh, what was happening uh, um, it was a part of the monolith architecture when we yeah. saw this issue and we actually figured out how to fix that right so basically what was happening i was talking about we were taking a lock on the balance so mm-hmm. merchant has two kind of balances right now in resapay uh, one is the virtual account balance where we credit the money whatever the payment is happening on that system mm-hmm. and there is another kind of a you can say a wallet kind of system where mm-hmm. merchants can go and load the money okay mm. now for every payment we charge a fee right uh, yeah. a razor pay fee on a transaction so let's say a payment is happening of 100 rupees we are charging 2 rupees out of it mm. so that 2 rupees either can be deducted from his wallet amount mm. and if the wallet amount is not present then we deduct it from his virtual account balance that's mm. how the balance work okay now uh, one day we figure out ki for most of the merchants the settlement has been skipped mm. there was not enough balance and the settlement was skipped so mm. we started digging deep what what actually happened and uh, we we started looking into slow query logs anything happened any exception happened mm. uh, we were not able to figure out right so uh, since the moat architecture was something like that so for each in the balance table uh, for each merchant there was a single row okay mm. and there is a column called balance so let's say mm. the current balance is 500 and a mm. new payment transaction happens of 100 rupees now how it updates it like it, it fetches the balance in the locking situation okay. and uh it updates it to 500 plus 100 and then it updates again and then release the lock same thing happens in the credits also Correct. right so uh, uh now what is happening so uh, we were digging deep so we build our own ledger system to, on the google sheets to figure out what is happening we pulled out all the transactions data okay and 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 the best part is it was only happening on a high tps merchants when it okay high rps so it was happening at very rare scenario which we have to figure out also how to Uh, actually make it uh, again in the staging environment right uh, how how to make it replay again in the staging environment so we started doing the performance sensing and then we eventually figured out it is happening and uh, uh, how it is happening so there was another process which was running concurrently with the payments flow which is a payment transfer flow okay mm-hmm. so if you see the payments was taking a log on the credit table first mm-hmm. and then on the balance table mm-hmm. right the payment transfer flow was taking a lock on balance table first and then on the credit table mm. deadlock has happened <laughs> and due to <laughs> due to some of the configurational issues on my sql side mm. it was not throwing that exception and dirty reads were happening <sighs> so you can imagine uh, yeah. every payment is reading the same balance yes. on a high concurrency and uh, it's updating the wrong balance right yes. and the balance was not updated correctly so the settlement was skipped correct how do we fix it right so we started looking at the performance schema of my sql table mm. we started looking at the bin logs of it and we actually we analyzed ki yes there are two threads which are actually trying to take a log and both are getting the logs how did it happen mm. right and the exception was actually consumed by the application log because of that feature was not enabled of the my sql attribute so uh, 
that but eventually we figured it out we corrected the data and we fixed the bug also so and we made sure ki our ci catches those bugs <laughs> so uh, that's insane yeah. one thing that you spoke about is that uh uh your settlements were skipped and that was really important like you did not let a lot of things go wrong even though yeah. the uh, even though the deadlock was happening you still ensured that if it is not right you would skip it rather than yeah. rather than basically letting the wrong information so again uh, correctness of the data unless and until you are 100% sure you should not be moving forward such an interesting correct, thing correct correct and yeah. database deadlock everyone has heard about it very few see it you have fixed it so god yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So and the best and... part is uh, we we are actually yeah. making sure it is not happening in microservice architecture now <laughs> so because <laughs> now we have a different database and how we are scaling the ledger platform now it's it's a totally different architecture right now like how the database has been built for ledger and uh, to be, make a more robust system right we mm -hmm. we are talking about we have a cron we have a two way handshake mechanism on cdc right now mm -hmm. it's just not that we we actually run reporting engine on on our warm storage which actually do a parity checks between two payment sources so it, even if in the worst scenarios we have our parity check to make robustness of the system and that's really but like most people don't even think about having this but this this asynchronous job that is running which is just ensuring the correctness of the system becomes such an important piece of component because it can like right away throw because these are not infrastructure level alerts these are yeah, yeah, yeah. these are your business logic alerts where are this these two payments is having some sort of parity or the replication lag is high or something around that like these are your business logic based alerts which are much more important especially for a finance I I worked on something very similar at basically one of my uh, past employers where we had to ensure the correctness of the data again not on the infrastructure side because it is very much possible that infrastructure is running much finer like it's 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 all it's all it's all uh, happy go lucky state in the infrastructure side but business logic is all messed up and such <laughs> jobs people think it's hack it's not hack it's like when you want to ensure the correctness of the system you have to do it right yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. Brilliant. This is this is such and such an interesting piece of insight. Uh, you talked about chaos. You talked about testing. So much of unit tests, regression tests. So many things go behind the scene. That we we make payment. We use UPI like like nothing. We make uh, we we make purchases. We make uh, purchases on Swiggy, Zomato. They all use you folks behind the scenes. And just imagine razor pay down. They can't make the payment. Revenue loss. Such an important piece of software you folks are writing. Pretty pretty deep, pretty Correct. dope to be honest. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, uh, that's all. Like, thanks, thanks. This was pretty interesting. I got to be honest. I got to learn so much, and I and I really am sure. And I, I don't even hope. I'm hundred percent sure. People watching this, they would love. They would <laughs> love to dive deep into this part, like how you folks are doing it. And obviously, the the overall kind of buffet you you presented of all the databases would make an engineer so happy. Are sab kuch hai. Like. <laughs> brilliant 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 and again really happy to uh, have you worked on like to be able to speak with you someone who has seen such issues uh, especially yeah. the the last part when we talk about that you had to put the you had to load the data in google sheets to ensure ki chal kya raha hai and that's <laughs> how you like in most cases uh, when you are working with systems that some cases happen only at high tps have to do whatever it takes to enter ki chal kya raha batao so yeah, thanks thanks so much arjun for such an interesting discussion loved every single part of it so folks who are watching do do hit this video like like do like this video uh, go through it and i'm 100% sure you have to go through this video at least twice to understand what has happened but uh, such is the power of engineering like when good engineers come together they build systems at this scale to ensure correctness of data Right. And it's not just normal data, it's money. They can't let anything go wrong. And this is the beauty of engineering, which I want all of you, all of you to go through, learn. And plus a huge shout out to Razorpay team and their engineering blog. I would highly encourage each and every one of you to go through it. Like such a brilliant resource for every engineer. Be, no matter at which stage of your career you are at, go read it. You'll learn a lot. And like always, I always promote, implement what you have read. It's easy to mimic in local state. But do it. But once again, thanks so much, so much, Arjun. It was quite fun. 
brilliant, brilliant having you. Sometime in the future, if our paths cross again, we'll have yet another discussion. Sure, sure. Thank you, Arpit. Thank you so much. Yeah.